This call is now being recorded. Good afternoon all and a warm welcome to our resource person of the moment, uh, Dr. Imtiaz Qayyum. Uh, sir is an assistant professor and junior scientist toxicology division of EEM faculty of fisheries cost Kashmir. And the topic chosen for deliberation is bioavailability of chemical contaminants in aquatic ecosystems a toxicological, toxicological approach. So you are visible as well as audible and your presentation is also visible. Please start. Assalamu alaikum and very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I'm going to start my presentation today. Uh, this is actually a very burning topic these days and this is a very uh, novel uh, research area which is yet to be dealt with in most of the uh, parts of our country that uh, as far as toxicological approaches are concerned in relation to the fisheries, in relation to the aquaculture, uh, they have been uh, really dealt uh, up till now. Uh, those areas, uh, those parts of the countries which are um, actually the agricultural parts and where the pesticides are being sprayed, where uh, natural uh, uh, fertilizers are not relied upon much, but synthetic fertilizers are being applied for the development of crop. And uh, those areas which are uh, very well developed as far as the industrial growth are concerned, uh, these areas are prone to have contaminants uh, in the uh, atmosphere, uh, they're, they are prone to have contaminants in their soils and ultimately these contaminants reach our aquatic water bodies and cause a lot of problems therein. Therefore, this is the toxicological part which has been uh, nearly addressed in our country and uh, in this aspect I will be uh, giving my lecture today. Therefore, to start with, uh, we, we all know that aquatic uh, environments, they are the sinks, ultimate sinks of all the runoff which come from their catchment area. Since aquatic ecosystems, our ponds, our lakes, rivers, and other aquatic uh, biota, they are naturally placed in the depressions. They are depression, uh, placed at the depression from the no normal ground. Therefore, whatever comes from the catchment area ultimately reaches to the aquatic environments. And uh, these environments, they get polluted as far as uh, uh, surface runoff is concerned. Uh, when rain, rainfall occurs, it will uh, carry away all the contaminants uh, with them and it will reach the aquatic ecosystems. And not only this, if uh, drift also occurs, drift also will carry away the contaminants, being it plastics, being it metals, being it pesticides, being uh, synthetic fertilizers, everything will go with the drift, surface drift, to the uh, aquatic water bodies. Not only this, uh, in advanced countries like America and uh, various countries like Brazil and Argentina, where the aerial spray of pesticides is being carried out for uh, killing of pests uh, in, in the agricultural fields. And these uh, pesticides, they remain suspended in the uh, atmosphere as a small droplets and those droplets well, when precipitation occurs, they uh, get uh, washed away with the, the rain into the natural water bodies. Therein, they cause a lot of uh, negative impacts to the aquatic flora and aquatic fauna therein. And um, uh, these uh, contaminants can reach our aquatic ecosystems both from the point sources and non-point sources. I need not to elaborate it 
but just i will uh, remind you the definition that point sources are those sources of uh, pollutions which are defined and uh, which are identifiable uh, identifiable sources of pollution example uh, the discharges coming out from the industries that they, they are identifiable and they reach our aquatic ecosystems similarly the discharges from the sewage treatment plants discharges from the ditches discharges from the pipes which uh, are channelized uh, from the households and industries or any other mills or firms or factories into our aquatic ecosystems since they are identifiable therefore they will be uh, counted as or enlisted in the point sources of pollution while as the non point of sources of pollution they are diffused they are not identifiable actually for example the beautiful example and perfect example in this regard is the leaching uh, of pesticides down uh, the ground down the soils and which uh, enters into aquatic ecosystems through uh, the ground water table these are the non points and they are not actually identifiable they get carried away with the rains they get carried away with the uh, aerial drifts they get carried away with the surface runoff and they get carried away with precipitation to our aquatic ecosystems and solid and liquid waste you all know they are uh, part of households uh, and they are part of agricultural runoff and of course they are the discharges from the industries they are discharges from the factories and mills and what not and uh, they include uh, plastics metals persistent organic pollutants paints and they are all called as xenobiotic compounds uh, let me um, uh, first uh, tell you the xenobiotic compound is actually a foreign body which uh, might not be present in our lakes which might not be present in our aquatic water bodies okay and uh, similarly there is a confusion or there is an amalgamation between two terms one is called as pollutant and one is called as contaminant first of all uh, let me uh, clear uh, the confusion between the two before proceeding for uh, the next slides actually uh, the contamination refers to the presence of xenobiotic compounds in aquatic ecosystem by contamination we means those foreign bodies which might not be present but they are mostly the synthetic or man made uh, uh, this in nature they include metals uh, heavy metals they include uh, synthetic pesticides they include paints they include persistent organic pollutants um, and etc uh, they can cause pollution more precisely they can cause contamination uh but it's not necessary that all contaminants are pollutants all contaminants can never be pollutants because uh, they might be present in very low quantities their residues might be present in very small quantities uh-huh. or even if present in higher amounts uh they can be squistered in one or other component of uh, aquatic ecosystems therefore their squistration since they are squistered uh, that will not lead to the pollution in aquatic ecosystem while as pollution is a broader term and it can passes contamination as well but with a difference when we envisage of a pollution in natural water bodies uh, we uh, must quickly uh, refer to the increase in the nutrient level of our water bodies means by pollution we must uh, uh, refrain ourselves or restrict ourselves uh, to the increase in the level of nitrates and phosphates only when we say nitrates and phosphate increase it's called as pollution okay but there might be a confusion in our minds that uh, then what's called as pesticide pollution that should be called as pesticide contamination or what's called as metal pollution it co- must be called as metal contamination yes of course metal contamination uh pesticide contamination 
or plastic contamination or microplastic contamination, they are actually the real terms which must be used. But since I told you that pollution is a broader term, it encompasses all types of pollutions as well as contamination. That's why when talking of metal contamination or metal pollution, we add word pollution in the suffix. We won't uh, use uh, word metal alone. Fine. Therefore, we won't use pesticide alone, but we will use the word metal pollution, the pollution caused by metals or the pollution caused by pesticides. Otherwise, contamination is an appropriate term which must be used uh, for the presence of xenobiotic compounds in aquatic ecosystems. Therefore, uh, I have just given this the pictorial representation uh, that the uh, emissions from the industries and the precipitation and uh, the fertilizers or pesticides which are being sprayed in our vegetation, uh, they all are carried uh, in, in uh, the aquatic uh, ecosystems, thereby uh, carrying negative impacts on the flora and the fauna uh, therein. The most hit in, in the water bodies are the fishes. So before going uh, forward, let us uh, uh, this, uh, understand some terminologies. Uh, what, is, what is actually bioavailability? Uh, bioavailability is a state of being potentially available uh, of any contaminant, which is available for the biological uptake of aquatic organisms. I already told you that uh, even if uh, pesticides or metals or other contaminants may be present in the water bodies, but they cannot be harmful because even uh, they are uh, either uh, squistered uh, in some compartment of uh, the aquatic ecosystem or uh, their uh, amounts are so low and residues are so minute, uh, they are merely responsible for causing uh, any hazard are causing any health effects to fishes. But what is actually the available amount of uh, residues of uh, xenobiotic compounds, that is uh, actually the bioavailable component, uh, in a, uh, bioavailable part, bioavailable uh, content of that component, of that xenobiotic to the aquatic ecosystem. When that organism is processing or encountering a given environmental medium, or it is a relative facility with which a chemical is transferred from the environment to a specific location in an organism of interest. Means it can be present anywhere in the aquatic ecosystem, but when organism encounters it and it's ready to uptake uh, this xenobiotic, uh, we will call that this xenobiotic compound is bioavailable for that organism. And this is a degree to which a drug or a substance or a xenobiotic compound becomes available and not only available, but to the specific site uh, of, of the uh, action where uh, it causes harm to the organisms. Now, uh, there is another term which is called as absolute bioavailability. This is actually the amount of internal dose uh, divided by the amount of uh, applied dose externally. Means uh, if, if a, a contaminant, a pesticide or, or a metal is available outside the body of the fish, it might not be bioavailable or it might be merely harmful or fishes, but when it's being taken, we give the ratio of internal dose, the internally what has been taken in by a fish, and uh, the ratio of it to the uh, amount of it present outside its environment. Right? This is the fraction of percentage of external dose, which reaches the systemic circulation, means which re reaches the blood to which it is carried through the or body or the target of the site of action. The ratio of internal dose to an applied dose. This is also called as bioavailability factor. Now, when, when an, uh, a xenobiotic is bioavailable uh, for a fish to be taken up, 
uh, it will be taken up by, by the fish. Not only it will cause harm for uh, in the fish uh, uh, body or in the fish physiology, but it will also lead to the bioaccumulation of these xenobiotics in the fish uh, bodies. Not only bioaccumulation, but it will magnify, it will get in increased um, throughout the food chain and it might reach to humans as well because humans lie at the top of the food chain, they directly eat fish and the xenobiotic compounds which are available, which are present in the fish body might reach to humans as well, therefore causing harms in the human body as well. Therefore, bioaccumulation is the net uptake of chemicals from the environment by an or all possible routes from any source in the aquatic environment where chemicals are present. Therefore, it will get accumulated in the fish body. And when, if, if we uh, remember uh, the uh, ecological pyramids, the pyramid of numbers, since uh, uh, we know that uh, in, in ecological uh, pyramids of numbers, uh, herbivores are at the bottom, but they are large in numbers. Uh, below them are uh, the producers, uh, they are more larger than herbivores. And up the pyramid, above the herbivores, there are uh, primary carnivores, then secondary carnivores, then tertiary carnivores. The, the moment you go up to the pyramid, stop, uh, you will find the number of the organisms is going on decreasing. Therefore, the amount which was present, the amount of the, the chemical or amount of a xenobiotic which was present at the base of the pyramid that will get concentrated and that will get accumulated um, in the higher food chain and it will also get magnified, which I will uh, tell you later on uh, through the pictorial representation in this PPT. Now, bioconcentration is an important uh, uh, term which refers to the bioaccumulation of compounds, but this bioconcentration is restricted to uh, the, the, the medium of water only. Because water has a heterogeneous nature, and, 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 and when a xenobiotic compound, when a pesticide or a chemical or a, or a metal that is present in, in, in the water, it is taken up by the fish through the medium itself. Bioaccumulation is actually uh, uh, refers to the uh, accumulation of a contaminant which is taken orally by uh, as a dose by, by terrestrial uh, uh, animals. But when, when uh, any xenobiotic is taken up through the medium, more particularly in fishes, it is called as bioconcentration. And uh, we should use the term bioconcentration as far as fisheries is concerned uh, instead of bioaccumulation. And bioconcentration factor, it is represented as the amount of contaminant which is retained in the fish tissues after it is being taken up by fishes. Fishes take up the uh, contaminants through different routes, which I will deal later on. And to the total number of, uh, to the total concentration of contaminant in the water. I Means since the uh, contaminant was present in water, it was taken up from the medium through fishes, it will be called as bioconcentration. Therefore, in, as a fisheries point of view, we uh, must switch uh, from bioaccumulation to the more appropriate term as bioconcentration. Now, whatever taken up by fishes, it is being not only bioaccumulated as uh, shown by the the, the diagram here, but uh, the level of the contaminants, it, it keeps on increasing uh, from the lower trophic levels to the higher trophic levels. And uh, therefore it gets magnified, which is called as biomagnification. You can see here from the water, the contaminant was taken up by producers, means small fishes or zooplankton, phytoplanktons. Now these producers, they are uh, eaten up by uh, the, the primary herbivores. Uh, these herbivores are being taken up by small fishes and large fishes, and which are uh, taken up by uh, fish-eating birds or animal and higher animals or 
the humans at the top of the food chain. Since I was I was talking about this this pyramid, this is the pyramid of number. The number of uh, organisms here is more. Therefore, whatever will be concentrated in, in these organisms, the pesticide or the metal, it is transferred directly to the food chain. Here, the number of organisms is less. Means if here the organs organisms was suppose for example 100 in number, and here and in zooplankton section it was 50 in number. Means whatever uh, it, a pesticide or a chemical or a xenobiotic was taken up here by producers. Uh, it, it will get magnified here uh, because the number of the organisms here is less. Similarly, uh, the small fishes are more or less as compared to the zooplankton population. Therefore, whatever taken up here, it gets concentrated and transferred and magnified in, in the higher trophic level. It will cause uh, magnification of the contaminants. And uh, just imagine uh, how much it will be biomagnified here in the large fish, which are directly taken up by the humans. Therefore, those areas where contamination of fishes, contamination of lakes uh, is higher as far as uh, the presence of pesticides are concerned, as far as presence of uh, metals, heavy metals are concerned, uh, what I told earlier, in, in the areas where uh, industries are developed, in the areas where uh, orchidists or uh, vegetable growers uh, spray a lot of pesticides, and that too, not under the uh, with the consultation of scientific staff, they indiscriminately and non-judiciously use uh, the pesticides and fertilizers uh, with an uh, whimsical thoughts that their uh, pesticide their, their crop will grow better, but they are uh, uh, oblivious about the situation that how these pesticides can tell upon the aquatic flora, the aquatic fauna, and how uh, far it uh, might have effects uh, uh, on the fishes and ultimately on the humans, which are directly relying on the fish uh, for their food. Now, what are the factors that are responsible for bioavailability of a chemical contaminant? This is very important, and we all must understand it. And um, it might take me some time to, uh, uh, to explain it. The structure and the chemical properties of any contaminant or any uh, of pesticide. I'm, I'm just mentioning the word pesticide because uh, pesticides are more uh, hazardous and uh, since I have worked with pesticides, um, uh, I, I, I will be very comfortable in giving examples of the pesticides only. Uh, the structural uh, properties and the chemical structures of the pesticides, they will be uh, um, the landmarks in uh, dictating uh, the bioavailability of those pesticides uh, to the aquatic organisms. The, the chemical speciation uh, also uh, are governed by the presence of water, the nature of the sediments, the suspended particles, and uh, many more other things, which I will uh, discuss in this PPT. Uh, just see the pictorial representation of the pesticides. I have uh, uh, given the, uh, the four major classes of pesticides. One is organochlorines, second is organophosphates, number third is uh, carbamates, and number Fourth are pyrethroids. These are the four classes of pesticides which are extensively being used all over the world. And these are their uh, general structures, actually. Uh, organochlorines, they are actually the organic compounds with uh, at least one covalently bonded chlorine atoms. The more chlorine atoms you will uh, incorporate in their structure, uh, the more persistent these contaminants would be in the uh, environment. You just take it as a thumb rule that the num more you increase the number of chlorine atoms in organochlorine pesticides, the more lipophilic, the more persistent uh, these organic uh, these compounds will be in the aquatic ecosystems or in any, any compartment of the nature, being it soil, being it water, being it fish, or being it in humans as well. You, you might uh, uh, 
study about the research that the orchids which are uh, uh, indiscriminately spraying or spraying the pesticides without masks without uh, the proper care these organochlorines these organochlorines get uh, attached to their uh, fatty parts like belly like cheeks like buttocks like thighs uh, they will get concentrated uh, in in those lipophilic parts in in the humans as well uh, regarding uh, the mechanism of action of these organochlorine uh, compounds uh, they have been found uh, to get attached at the gaba site g a b a uh, i will just uh, this is this is the gaba site you know this is the cell membrane fine this is the phosphid uh, phospholipid bilayer dude mosaic model you all might be knowing this this is uh, what we study in in the secondary classes or higher secondary classes this is the gaba site here the organochlorine compounds uh, get attached at the gaba receptors and they uh, form chloride ionophore complexes this is the chloride ionophore complexes which uh, will inhibit uh, uh, the action of chlorine here okay uh, the action of chlorine which gets inhibited in the gaba site uh, it causes uh, inhibition of chlorine to flow in the nerve thereby causing uh, the paralysis therefore this is the mechanism of these uh, organochlorine compounds these are very persistent in nature as far as you can see this is the uh, 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 aliphatic or aromatic hydrocarbon with three chlorine uh, atoms associated with it means three chlorine atoms it will be highly persistent in nature it will be highly lipophilic it will get attached to the fish bodies it will get attached to the uh, plants as well which are organic in nature it it will get more clear in the following slides the example of this uh, organochlorine is the ddt you see there are 1 2 3 4 and 5 chlorine atoms which are uh, attached to the uh, double hexane ring of ddt means it might be highly persistent in nature and once it enters our lakes once it enters our water bodies it will have years of half life uh, so that uh, it will be bioavailable for the fishes it will be bioavailable for the aquatic plants it will be bioavailable available for the all commercially important plants and animals which are being eaten by humans on daily basis therefore um, these contaminants their chemical speciation Uh, will determine their bioavailability as well that's why uh, the ddt and endosulfan and eldrin and dieldrin these were the persistent organic compounds which have been found to have the huge amount of half lives they were replaced by less persistent organophosphate compounds this is these are the esters of phosphoric acid organophosphates okay uh, is my cursor moving around please am i audible please yes sir oh yes, um, i just want to uh, mark these by my cursor is is my cursor moving yes sir okay okay fine these organophosphates i have given two examples i will tell you why i have given two examples of this there is a logic behind it this one is called as chlorpyrifos and other is called as dimethoate these are the important organochlorine compounds Mm, indiscriminately spread all over the world to the agricultural crops and these are the esters of phosphoric acids they are known to inhibit an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase this is here this is the uh, our nerves these are these are the synaptic clefts uh, wherein um, we need an acetylcholine hydrolyzed acetylcholine uh, to pass uh, the nerve impulses from the motor neurons and sensory neurons from and uh, from the brain to the body and to the body uh, from the body to the brain but what happens these um, uh, organochlorine compounds organophosphate compounds sorry they inhibit the hydrolysis of uh, acetylcholine 
by inhibiting an enzyme here in the synaptic cleft uh, called as acetylcholinesterase. The acetylcholinesterase inhibition leads to the accumulation of acetylcholine here in the synaptic clefts. The accumulation will lead to the inability of an organism to pass nerve impulses from the sensory and motor neurons from the brain to the body and from the body to the brain, vice versa. And uh, it will cause paralysis and ultimately death. Since they are uh, less persistent uh, as compared to organochlorines, but they have been found highly toxic to fishes, even if they are present in small concentrations or they are present in our water bodies for the less period of time, still they are highly toxic to fishes. Now, what is the purpose that I have uh, chosen two uh, organophosphate uh, compounds here? You just see the, the, the structure of dimethoate here. This is the phosphoric acid. These are the esters of phosphoric acid. And with the sulfur uh, group, there is uh, some uh, nitrogen uh, compound which is associated with it. Uh, these are the uh, normal uh, uh, organophosphates which are less persistent as compared to the ZDT where chlorine atoms are present and uh, chlorine atom determines the persistence of a compound in aquatic ecosystems. But here in chlorpyrifos, look, uh, chlorpyrifos although being an organophosphate, it still has three chlorine atoms here associated with the benzene, uh, an aromatic this benzene ring. Now these chlorine atoms are dangerous enough it makes this chlorpyrifos more persistent in nature. And there are a lot of examples uh, which I can give that in organophosphate compounds, there are chlorine atoms present, which makes them as good as organochlorine compounds, which make them as persistent in organochlorine compounds, and which make them as hazardous to fishes as organochlorine compounds. Therefore, we must take into consideration whether these chlorine compounds, chlorinated, uh, these organophosphate compounds are required uh, by our orchidists or not. And they should be replaced by some organophosphates or other, other uh, compounds which are less persistent in uh, aquatic ecosystems. That's why these organophosphate compounds, these were replaced by the very less persistent compounds called as carbamates. There you have the uh, the carbamic acid okay uh, and you have a methyl ring or alkyl ring uh, alkyl compounds which are associated with this carbamic acid and examples to this are ldcar this this ldcar these are less persistent but their mechanism of action is same as organophosphates that is the inhibition of acetylcholinesterase enzyme and accumulation of acetylcholine in the synaptic clefts of uh, the nerves which causes the paralysis okay and uh, number last are the pyrethroid pesticides. These pyrethroid pesticides are actually, they are the derivati derivatives of uh, the natural pyrethrins, uh, like uh, chrysanthemum. But chrysanthemum, uh, 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 which drives various kinds of pyrethroids, which is called as uh, cypermethrin, or this elethrin, or delta methrin, or aspen uh, uh, extra. These are still very much uh, less persistent in our aquatic ecosystems, um, and uh, they have been replaced by these organic chlorines, organochlorines compounds, organophosphate compounds, which are still used. Now, although uh, one thing I forgot to say is that most of the organochlorine compounds, like endosulfan, which was used indiscriminately in our aquatic, in our orchards, has uh, found to be uh, getting accumulated in our uh, natural ecosystems, and uh, it has been banned by the government of India uh, on account of its high persistence and very mm, high half lives in the aquatic uh, biotas. Uh, now, uh, what uh, all I wa wanted to tell is the chemical speciation of a compound. It will determine its bioavailability in the aquatic ecosystem. Uh, Number next is the octanol water partition coefficient. This is very important and it is correlated with 
uh, the speciation as well. The more amount of chlorine, as I said, present in uh, any contaminant, more it will be persistent in uh, the nature. This is calculated by log of KOW, which is called as octanol water partitioning coefficient. We say, uh, let, let me simplify it by giving you an example that in a beaker, I will uh, uh, fill half of the beaker with water and half of the beaker with N octanol, the normal chain, uh, aliphatic octanol. Uh, since octanol being, in, being a hydrocarbon and it has less density than water, it will remain above the water and they will be two immiscible liquids and they will form a layer in between. Uh, now, uh, to check the lipophilicity or the hydrophobicity of any compound, for example, DDT, for example, this chlorpyrifos, which I, exam uh, I gave the example earlier, I will uh, put this DDT in this beaker. Okay. And I will see in which compartment the chlorpyrifos or this DDT or this pesticide will uh, settle into. If it is settles into an NF octanol, that means it's, it is lipophilic because it has settled, settled in the organic phase of the compound, uh, this beaker. Or if it is hydrophilic, means water loving, it will settle down to the phase of water. Therefore, uh, the more chlorine uh, present in the uh, rings, more it will tend to settle uh, at the octanol uh, phase. And it is the amount of contaminant which is retained in the octanol. Uh, to the ratio of amount of contaminant in the water. Uh, the chemicals which have octanol water partitioning coefficient more than five, they are considered as hydrophobic, means lipophilic, means they will try to find the places in the aquatic ecosystem which are organic in nature, means they will try to get attached to the fishes, they will try to get attached to the zooplanktons because they are organic, they will try to get, get attached to the phytoplanktons because they are organic, they will try to get attached to the, the aquatic weeds and plants because they are organic as well. And one more thing, they will try to get settled down at the base of the oceans or the lakes where there is a lot of amount of organic matter present. I will deal it with um, the other slide, which is called as extracellular polymeric substances that are settled down um, at the floor bed of the lakes. Therefore, uh, uh, these uh, chemicals having log of KOW more than five, they will try to attach themselves in a water body to the uh, fish population, to the organic populations, organic uh, uh, matters present therein. While as those compounds, those uh, pesticides, which are which are hydrophilic, having log of KOW uh, less than uh, five, they will uh, remain in the water suspended. Now, whether the pesticide attached itself to uh, the organic part in the lake or whether it will uh, remain suspended in the water, it is both ways harmful for fishes because fishes they will uptake this contaminant both from the water and both from the organic part. That I will explain later on. Number second is the half-life of a compound. This half-life is also determinant only when uh, the speciation of a chemical is uh, sorted out. As I told you, DDT having five number of chlorines, it will be highly persistent. Look what EPA says. Uh, EPA says that DDT has 150 years of half-life. Means if you uh, drop one gram of uh, DDT in an aquatic ecosystem, after 150 years, it will uh, now lower down to 120, it will, it will lower down to 0 0.5 uh, grams. Means for 150 years, it will be bioavailable. It will be uh, ready to be taken up by the fishes. And just imagine if it is one ppm of DDT present in the lake, that means one liter of the water of lake contains one milligram of DDT, how much it will be harmful for the fishes and how much it will be harmful for the aquatic plants, which are commercially important. And 
although they might be weeds, but they are indirectly directly taken up by the fishes. Therefore, in that way, it will get transferred to the fish population as well. And ultimately, those fishes, when eaten up by the humans, it will get transferred to their body as well. That's why we see the rate of cancers, they are increasing day, day by day because we are eating the contaminated, uh, contaminated fishes uh, in the areas mostly where uh, water bodies are contaminated highly. The half-life is the time taken by a certain amount of a compound to be reduced by half. This occurs as it dissipates or breaks down in the environment. There are various factors which govern the half-life as well, which is beyond the scope of this lecture this time. And um, I will restrict it that uh, the examples which I gave earlier uh, in the chemical speciation means DDT, it, its uh, half-life has been found uh, 150 years. Uh, now, CPF, uh, this is the chlorpyrifos, uh, organophosphate, its half-life is 30. Comparatively, see the dibutyate. It is organophosphate as well, but its half-life is only eight days. Why CPF have, uh, have half-life higher than dimethate? Al although being in the same class of compounds, because of the presence of chlorine uh, atoms in their benzene rings, which I was uh, talking about earlier. Now, LD-carb, this is uh, carbamate compound, and its half-life is five to 10 days, depending upon the pH of a compound. And similarly, alethrin pyrethroid uh, compound, its half-life is only uh, 4.3 days. This is the pictorial representation of half-life of a compound. See, uh, uh, this is an example of DDT, if you, if you will take it. See, this is the 100% of the amount. That means one ppm of DDT, for example, in aquatic ecosystem. Uh, it will take uh, 150 years to get reduced to 0 0.5 mg. Then another 150 years to get reduced to 0 0.25 mg. And see, uh, you can imagine for how many years uh, DDT will remain in the aquatic ecosystems and it will be bioavailable for the fishes to be taken up by them and causes harmful effects in them. Now, this is an important concept, the photolysis of a compound. There are various lot of compounds, uh, especially pesticides, which when enter into the uh, ecosystems, aquatic ecosystems, they get broken down by, by the photolysis action. They get broken down uh, by, by the UV radiations, and they are uh, uh, transformed either into a non-toxic form of uh, compounds, or uh, they can uh, be broken down into the daughter compounds, which are even more highly toxic than the parent compound. For example, I will take an example of endosulfan. Endosulfan, when it enters into aquatic ecosystems, it get, gets usually broken down into three uh, daughter compounds. One is called as alpha endosulfan, another is called as beta endosulfan, and a third one is called as endosulfan sulfate. And imagine the beta endosulfan and endosulfan sulfate. It has been found more toxic than the parent compound itself and more persistent in nature. Endosulfan sulfate has been found twice the uh, twice persistent as compared to its parent compound. Therefore, the photolysis of any compound it is also it also governs its bioavailability in the aquatic ecosystem. Now this is an important concept which I was telling earlier. Just see when uh, you imagine the floor bed of a lake uh, in, in in any part of the world, it is comprised of humus. It is compi comprised of uh, enormous amount of. Uh, this, microbial fauna, and it is comprised of dead and decayed matter. Uh, these uh, extracellular polymeric substances are the natural polymers which are secreted by actually microorganisms uh, around their colonies to maintain the structural integrity of the biofilms. Now, th these extracellular pol polymeric substances, they are uh, uh, composed of DNA, they are composed of lipids, they are composed of humic acids, and which are all organic. Now, if a compound which is organic having octanol water partitioning coefficient more than five, when it will enter the lake, it will directly settle down to the floor bed and it will be sequestered where 
uh, in the extracellular polybic substances uh, in the floor bed. Now, we know that fishes, they uh, uh, remain in the uh, columns uh, or, or the, the column of the lake or at the top of the lake or at the bottom of the lake. The, the example is the Cypress Scorpio, which remains in, in, at the bottom of the lake. Uh, Cyrillus uh, Marigala, which remains at the bottom of the lake. Cypress Scorpio has been found to um, take the uh, the scrap, the, this floor of the lake for the search of the food. Even if some of the fishes, they uh, eat uh, the mud as an accidental food uh, in the times when the, the, the primary food or their staple food is not available. Now, if the organic uh, substances, these uh, extracellular polybic substances, they squister uh, the, the best side, they will get directly transferred to the fishes, those bottom dwellers which directly eat or scrap the floor beds. Not only this, uh, the rooted uh, weeds, the rooted aquatic plants, which are rooted down the ground, they they will they will uh, take up those organic compounds. They will take up those pesticides through the polybaric substances uh, into their body, which are directly eaten up by fishes uh, later on, or they are directly taken up by the humans for their consumption. Therefore, they will get transferred uh, to, to to the humans as well to the food chain. Therefore, in whatever way possible. Uh, pesticide enters an uh, ecosystem, aquatic ecosystem. It is harmful for fishes. It is harmful for humans later on. These are the pictorial uh, scanning electron microscopic pictures of extracellular polymeric substances, and these are potent enough to to, to take up the contaminants which are later on eaten up by fishes. Now, in whatever way, whether the the the, the uh, compound is organic and it will uh, the settle down to the organic part of the uh, lake or it's hydrophilic uh, means it will get uh, suspended it will remain in the water for 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 uh, vaguest amount of time or for, for a lot of time in one way or the other it will get released and it will be taken up by fishes now, there are three uh, portal of entries, three routes by which fishes can uh, take up these contaminants. Number one, primary and foremost important are the gills. Number two are, are uh, uh, the, the surface, their body surface. And number three is GIT. And when these uh, compounds are taken up by uh, fishes uh, uh, through any route, they cause serious damages and serious negative impacts in their physiology leading to the toxicological conditions leading to toxicopathological conditions in the fishes now these are the uh, uh, various um, uh, this, uh, pathological conditions or uh, toxicopathological conditions uh, caused by pesticides in fishes i have summed up, up in this diagram now they cause damages in their tissues you can find a lot of literature um, regarding the histopathological uh, alterations in their gills, in their kidneys, in their liver, and in their gastrointestinal tracts, or whatnot. And far most and important is the behavioral uh, changes. Uh, it is a very virgin field. The behavioral toxicology has never been dealt uh, up till now, or rarely dealt up till now. There's a lot of scope that we can um, work on the behavioral changes uh, caused by the contaminants in fishes. Uh, to add to your information, there are a lot of behavioral indices which are characterized as quantitative and qualitative behavioral indices. Uh, you can search my papers on uh, in, in Google. Uh, you will you will come to know about uh, their their behavioral changes caused uh, due to the pesticides in in the fishes. The genotoxicity is are the chromosomal aberrations. And, and and the formation of micronuclear in 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 the hematocytes of fishes these, these are the genotoxicological uh, aspects hematological alterations they cause severe anemia to the fishes they lead to the restriction of uh, rbcs they cause lowering the hematological indices like 
packed cell volume and uh, MCH or MCHC uh, leading to severe anemic problems in the fishes. They also cause discoloration of the, uh, the fish hematocytes uh, leading to microcytic and hypochromic, hypochromic anemia, uh, anemic conditions. And there are um, reproductive damages in the larvivorous fishes as well. That is called as teratogenesis, which cause dysfunctions in the formation of embryo, leading to the development of mal uh, embryos and mal fries and fingerlings later on. Biochemical modifications will include the serious disruption or serious dysfunctions of liver enzymes like lactate dehydrogenase, like uh, um, glucose content uh, reduction, like uh, aspartate amino transport reductions, and whatnot. And it also leads to the hypoxic conditions. We have seen pesticides ca causing uh, uh, pesticide intoxicated fishes. They gallop from the ponds, uh, they gallop from the aquaria out to the outside uh, uh, environment for, for the procurement of oxygen. As, as said earlier, they are the inhibitors of acetylcholinesterases, they are the inhibitors of sodium potassium channels, they are inhibitors of the GABA sites, which causes neurotoxicity in fishes directly. And they also lead to the serious disruption in the protein contents, and they also uh, are the endocrine disruptors, causing serious damages to the endocrine uh, disrupting sites. By this, I conclude uh, and I uh, open up for the discussion. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, if there are any questions or interaction, please start. Uh, there is one question uh, in the chat box. Where are all agricultural pests? Oh, oh, sorry, this just a second. Let me read it out. Uh, what are all the agricultural pesticides affect the fish production in aquatic organism and expression of gene under pesticide impacts? Uh, can I see the uh, actually chat box? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you clear? need to uh, you need to click on the uh, chat. Okay, okay. I, have, I have I have I have just uh, come up with this. What are the all agricultural pesticides affect the fish production and aquatic organisms and expression of gene under pesticide impacts? I think uh, uh, he he just wants to say are all agricultural pesticides harmful for fishes? Is it uh, Mr. Subramanian? Uh, if you're po if, if possible, Mr. Subramanian, you can uh, clarify on your question via audio. Hello? Maybe audio is not available for him. You, you can uh, take the question uh, to the best of your knowledge and uh, reply it on that ground. So I don't think he's uh, responding in audio. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Subramaniam. Uh, actually, uh, all agricultural pesticides, which are uh, sprayed in 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 the uh, orchards or vegetable gardens or or in the croplands, they have actually the impact on the target organisms pests. Okay, but since they are they are harmful for the pests in one way or the other, they cause their paralysis in them, they cause hematological disruptions in them, they cause uh, pathophysiological changes in them. Uh, when they reach to the non-target sites, like aquatic ecosystems, therein the mechanism of action is the same. Therefore, they will have the same effect in the fishes as well. They will have the same impact on the other zooplanktons as well. Therefore, they will paralyze the fishes the same way they will paralyze the aquatic, these pest organisms, they will paralyze the zooplanktons, they will paralyze uh, other uh, um, uh, organisms in aquatic ecosystems. In the same way, they will paralyze where? In the croplands. Therefore, nearly all pesticides, 
they have been found to cause uh, negative impacts in the aquatic ecosystems. Now, there is a concept of organic farming. What do you mean by organic farming? Actually, um, uh, the people who have put forth this concept that we must rely on the organic farming is that we must not use pesticides at all. We must rely on the uh, organic fertilizers, uh, uh, biofertilizers rather, uh, which will uh, uh, increase the crops, crop production, and we will uh, be not be able uh, to get harmed with the synthetic fertilizers. But actually, um, Practically speaking, uh, absolute organic farming is never possible because uh, let us uh, assume, for example, we will uh, use uh, synthetic fertilizer, uh, biofertilizers. But what about the pests which damage our crop? Whatever, uh, what, what about the, the, those organisms which are very much harmful for the crops as well? Uh, and and they are getting readily uh, uh, time and again mutated to come up with the more resilience to come up uh, with more uh, uh, immune system to um, battle with the pesticides. Therefore, uh, we must say that pesticides spring is necessary in in the croplands. Uh, we cannot avoid spring of pesticides. But what is to be uh, prevented? What is to be taken care of? That these pesticides should not reach the aquatic ecosystems. They should not reach the non-target organisms. And those pesticides should be used judiciously under scientific supervision. And they should be used, uh, only those pesticides should be relied upon, which are less persistent in the nature, in the soils, in the water, in aquatic ecosystems, and etc. Because since when they will be less persistent, uh, they will get readily dissociated into the non-toxic forms, thereby causing less problems to the aquatic biota. Hope is, is the answer for the question. Anybody else? There's one more. A poll? Yeah, yeah, there are two more in the chat itself. Okay. Let me find it. The percentage of pesticide reservoir, a reserve of a fish food, is being retained by the consumer human. What is what percentage of accumulated pesticide reserves of a fish food is being retained by the consumer humans? Actually, this also depends upon an individual study, sir. Uh, actually, uh, I just told you about DDT or endosulfan. These are persistent. These are lipophilic. They will tend to be uh, uh, associated in the in the fat tissue of the fishes. And when they are being eaten by uh, humans, uh, it will get directly transferred to them uh, uh, in the, in the uh, uh, lipophilic parts of, of the humans. Uh, as I told, in the cheeks, in the bellies, in the thighs, in the buttocks, and they continue to remain therein for years together. Now, uh, the actual data, the actual uh, amount of half-life, I cannot tell you that because this need an, needs an individual study. For example, uh, uh, taking example of organochlorines, DDT, endosulfan, eldrin, and dieldrin, they must have different half-lives. They must have different persistence. They must have different uh, potential to get attached to uh, the compartments in the fishes, in the humans, in the water, in the aquatic biota, and so on and so forth. Similarly, uh, every pesticide needs to be studied individually in order to ascertain and how much concentration it will get accumulated in the humans as well. OK, hope this is the answer of the question. Uh, next, what was this? Upon accidentally contamination of agriculture found by the farmer, what does he what he does for saving his fishes? Now, uh, actually, sir, um, when pesticides are present in um, large amounts, it will cause mass mortality of fishes in the ponds. But if there are pesticide residues present in in, in the fish ponds, uh, 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 fishes will exhibit behavioral changes. Fishes will exhibit uh, physiological changes. And if farmer feels 
that there are the behavioral and physiological changes, first of all, he must uh, consult a limnologist first to get his water quality done. Then uh, he must consult a pathologist. A pathologist will ascertain whether there are external signs of any disease. If uh, there are not any external signs of disease as well, then he must be able, he must consult a toxicologist. His toxicologist will advise him to first uh, take fishes outside uh, the pond and transfer uh, to them, uh, them to, to, to a uh, pond having a fresh water uh, where the fishes will detoxify themselves. Actually, there is a, um, an in inbuilt capacity in fishes and in other uh, organisms as well. Uh, 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 that is called as capacity of biotransformation of xenobiotics. Organisms are self-sustained uh, to break down the toxic compounds which enter their water bodies and break down them into non-toxic forms until they are not to the uh, present in the concentration which are higher than the acceptable daily intake. That is called as ADI, acceptable daily intake. Uh, if uh, the toxicants are present more than acceptable dairy intake, means they will get more accumulated in the fish body. For that thing, you have to quarantine the fishes, you have to change their water and get your water tested. Your water can be tested by using uh, various chromatographic methods like uh, HPLC, like GLC, like GCMSMS, and uh, the toxicologist will give you the suggestion that your water is contaminated with the pesticides or not. Similarly, you can give him samples of fishes, a couple of fishes, and he will uh, just uh, sacrifice them and he will just analyze their tissues, their internal organs, for the presence of pesticides. And if he recommends you that the amount of pesticides present in the fishes or in the water is high, then you must consult a toxicologist. He will guide you. Uh, how to get your ponds rid of the toxic agents. Okay, uh, can I have a more question, please? Rapid method for screening of... Oh, yeah. Yes, rapid method is... Uh, uh, sir, there are various toxic agents. Number one, um, uh, you might have seen that uh, bleaching powder somehow when it enters into our aquatic ecosystems, it, it, it kills um, fishes on the mass level. The bleaching powder, if present in the uh, water, the water and the fish which uh, has died of bleaching powder must reach a toxicologist uh, uh, within three, four hours. Because, you know, if you will keep uh, water still uh, containing bleaching powder, it will get evaporated. Okay. Okay. And uh, yes, therefore, it must reach within a couple of hours uh, to the toxicologist. And that too, the fishes must be. Uh, uh, packed in a cold ice so that bleaching powder is squistered, it's entrapped in the fish body so that a toxicologist will uh, give uh, the exact amount of uh, toxicant present in the fish. Number one. Now, if pesticides are present in the water bodies or in, in, in the fish, the fishes must be uh, sent to the toxic uh, toxicologist or is in its lab in, in, in the ice conditions back in the ice okay and water uh, should be uh, cooled down uh, by by external ice keeping water in the bottle and uh, externally it should be surrounded with the ice okay now uh, a toxicologist will uh, analyze because we have a lot of uh, uh, equipments like gc if we are supposed to uh, uh, analyze pesticides from the water. Uh, gas liquid chromatography is the best method with uh, ECD electron capture detectors or NPD nitrogen phosphorus detectors and so on. And if uh, these are uh, present, uh, these pesticides in the fish and fish is to be analyzed, then uh, HPLC, high performance liquid chromatography, is the best equipment uh, to rely upon. Okay, can I have more questions, please? Is there any mechanism, treatment pro protocol, by which the bioaccumulated pesticides results can be eliminated, minimized from the fish body, so that we can ensure food safety? Yes, it, it, of course. Actually, if pesticide residues are established in fish body and fishes are alive, you must uh, quarantine them 
and you must change their water and you must give them a healthy environment so that their immune system will get boosted up and they will try to biotransform they will try to detoxify themselves of pesticides number one number two there are various um, uh, vitamin uh, immunity bo boosters uh, uh, like vitamin c like saffron here in kashmir like spirulina and uh, like antioxidants which have been uh, found in literature to detoxify fishes uh, from the pesticides or metals. Therefore, you must consult a toxicologist. He will give you the better option, which pesticides present in the fish and which antioxidant or which uh, vitamin that needs to be uh, taken by the fish uh, to counter the toxic insults. OK. Uh, kindly share your mail ID, sir. Yes, sure. I will share my mail ID as well. Um, my mail ID is Dr. Sheikh Imtiaz. I will write it here. This is my personal mail ID, and my official is uh, mail ID is uh, Dr. Imtiaz. For you. Post Kashmir dot ac dot in dr imtiaz kuyum at the rate of squash kashmir dot ac dot in okay in indian fishes what are the major toxicant effects and what is the remedy or how to solve it i think i have given um, answer to this uh, remedies and solve it in indian fishes you can see our uh, river ganga is highly polluted and highly uh, contaminated by the pesticides uh, your river narmada in madhya pradesh is highly polluted and highly contaminated with the pesticides. Therefore, uh, toxicologists uh, they need to ascertain the, uh, the the nature of the pesticide, the type of the pesticide, and the, the amount of the pesticide present in the waters, so that we can have a better protocol to save our fishes from uh, the toxic inserts of the pesticides and save our water bodies uh, from the contamination as well, because. Our water bodies in water, this water uh, is being used for portable purposes by the enormous amount of population uh, residing in and around the, uh, these water bodies. Uh, therefore, uh, those people who directly take up these, uh, this water for uh, washing their uh, uh, utensils and drinking and uh, uh, irrigation and uh, drinking their cattle, give, serving their cattle, these pesticides directly get transferred uh, to them as well. Therefore, toxicologists need to come in front and uh, give a toxicological profile of every lake so that uh, farmers and the stakeholders or the fishermen residing in and around the lakes, they get uh, 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 prevented from the toxic insults of these pesticides. Is there any rapid step test to check the fish food where it's toxicated. Uh, to, to my knowledge, there is no step as you check pH or you check DO. Uh, I don't know whether there is available or not, because to my knowledge, it has never been found. Uh, only GC and HPLC or GCMS um, or AAS for metals, atomic absorption spectrophotometry or ICP coupling plasma. These are the equipments which are used for, 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 for the detection of pesticides and metals and all all toxicants. OK, any other question, please? Uh, there are any people who directly want to ask. Uh, Rajesh Fish has raised his hand. You want to ask a question, please ask. The chat ones are over. Uh, if you are going to ask, please ask directly. Any input or interaction or question, please ask. Is there any? I don't think there are any further questions. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm I'm uh, uh, obliged. I'm... And on behalf of on behalf of the uh, organizing committee, would want to ex express and extend our gratitude to you, sir, for taking this uh, impromptu uh, session because uh, it was planned for some other day and due to someone bailing out and. Uh, uh, you took up the matter. Yes. Uh, Actually, you don't, 
you you won't you won't believe actually i uh, at 12 when you called me i was just making the presentation and i was at slide 2 and uh, when you called me and i was confused what to say uh, uh, finally uh, i made it and uh, i am thankful to you i am thankful to all who have listened patiently who have listened carefully here are my colleagues dr ashfaq aga is my colleague there thanks to him there are my students uh, and there are my uh, teachers as well although uh, they have not taught me but uh, i consider uh, them as my teachers like uh, dr sagar mandal he is my facebook friend as well uh, good afternoon sagar sir uh, god bless you all, uh, all. and um, uh, i wish uh, that this presentation will be uh, would have been of uh, importance to you and if any query i have shared my mail you can directly mail me and you can interact with me i will be too willing uh, to have an interaction with you thank you all uh, have a nice day ahead thank you sir thank you thank you thank you We can all leave and join back tomorrow. Thank you.